Hussein is also known as Islam. How many of you know him as Islam? Hey, of course, Martin. <laughs> Martin maybe had a hand in his career. So uh, Hussein graduated, as I said, in 2008. And he is an artist, a DJ, a producer, and fuses Western, his Western and South Asian roots. While doing his political science degree at SFU, he was making a name for himself in the world music scene, fusing hip-hop beats with Bangra and Bollywood samples. Hussein's unique blend of tuition, <coughs> sorry, tuition? <coughs> Fusion music. <laughs> Uh, why don't he have alcohol at these uh, His unique blend of fusion music was noticed by several indigenous artists who wanted to do the same thing with their culture. This led Islam to work with Stolo Nation artist Inez, receiving a Juno nomination and several Western Canadian music awards for the project, all the way from the semester of dialogue. So please welcome the same. But what I understand, I'm going to talk and Lori's going to do interpretive dance. Yes, <laughs> um, uh, So like Lori said, my name is Hussein, also known as a slam, which is Assalamu like Assalamu alaikum, which means with peace. Uh, so I'm an artist and a producer in Vancouver. Um, and of course, I'm a graduate of the Semester in Dialogue program. Um, I love the concept of the Dialogue program, which I actually didn't understand until I was already like in the program, um, and maybe that changed after. But like, um, you guys know what, like false advertising is because that's what the dialogue program was like <laughs> the worst marketing. Uh, but maybe that's just how they suck you in. So, uh, so it's during the beginning of the term um, that you know we got to have our first group conversation with Mark. Um, and he explained a conversation that he had, and I think this was with a previous dean at SFU, that Mark's concept was that a student couldn't graduate from SFU, that they couldn't get their final degree until they'd proven that they had done something good or positive in the world with their degree, then they could graduate. Like, can, can you imagine the concept? Um, and so from that, that, First conversation, I was so hooked into the whole dialogue program. Um, so that led to the creation of the semester in dialogue. I still think that should be a requirement for SFU. I don't know if anyone can make that happen, but um, it would change what it means to be an SFU grad. Um, but as of right now, it changes what it means to be a graduate of the SFU semester in dialogue. It means that you actively did something beyond the classroom, beyond academia, the small, tight bubble that you know really needs to be blown up. And a lot of the conversations that I had with Mark were about getting beyond the classroom, right? Getting beyond the academics. Which is funny because you are an academic, so it's kind of funny. Um, a rogue, I didn't know the rogue, yeah, you're a rogue academic, that's a good title. Uh, so I'll talk about that project. So my final project, as I was trying to find my feet in music while I was at SNU, I never found somewhere in university to express my music and my academics. I'd always kept those two worlds separate. And so for my final project, um, I actually got to create a song called The Quiet Room, which was based on the book that we read during our semester called The Quiet Room. Um, and in that book, I had learned more about bipolar and schizophrenia than I ever did in my Psych 101 and 102 classes. And what is incredible is that the lessons that I learned and the concepts that we explored in that entire dialogue semester around mental health, around the healthcare system, it has continuously come up with me and my friends and my colleagues um, since then. It's actually a lot of the same issues that plague the healthcare system now that we talked about in 08. Um, Okay, so I took that one of those concepts in dialogue, which is taking important information, academic, legal, medical, whatever it is, and making it more open, available, and consumable to the public. And I heard a new term today, which was Westernization. What is West Winstonization? <laughs> I really heard this is good. So I had to Winstonize this concept of bipolar um, and schizophrenia because. It was such a, I think mental health plagues the city, and it is so misunderstood in the city. And so that simple book, I was like, man, when I, I have 
walked down the street since grade eight and I've seen people talking to themselves and it never clicked to me what was actually going on. And like, how can I make that one moment more like accessible, understanding, empathetic for when other people witness that? So that's kind of what I was thinking. That's why I was so like drawn to this book, I think especially just living in Vancouver. So I took this book that already made these mental health conditions more accessible, being an allegorical form, and summarized that book as best as I could into a song that was about five minutes. And it actually featured another artist who has schizophrenia who I met through another person in the class, which is part of that, the really beautiful networking that we were able to do. So bringing all of that through the funnel of dialogue, making this more understandable, um, and making it more accessible through a very short song that would then point people, hopefully, to the book or just to a broader understanding of that concept. So, can you imagine in any other class, instead of like a 20-page final essay, I go, okay, I did the readings. Trust me, I did the readings, so hear me out. Here's my idea. Instead of a paper or a test, how about I take what I learned, rap about it, Put some music, no sources, just trust me that I did it, um, and we'll call it even. Like, it, it, sounds, it sounds ludicrous, but that's literally the conversation that me and Mark had. Um, I remember, like, Mark, you'll say something, and then you'll, like, wait, because he's, like, actually listening, and then your heart just goes like this, because you're, like... Was this completely dumb what I just said or was this like something profound and you see like the ball rolling and And I remember I just remember the moment like hearing my heart in my chest and like, saying you're a complete idiot like why you? Um, anyway, and uh, Mark is like Yeah, that's cool. And I'm like yeah, that is cool. I'm like, that is awesome. And I was like it was like the, the explosion of energy and Yeah, Mark talked about how not only was it artistic, but it was accessible and that's what I really like. So that, and that, um, that mergingness of like artisticness and accessibility, you know, missed in my whole higher education. This was the only time that that ever happened in like my whole degree. So I'm not sure if during retirement, Mark, like you're going to just start like lecturing other like professors to like maybe make this happen. Uh, I would advocate for that. Um, <laughs> but the freedom of what it means to be an academic, to be an academic but also an artist, really started at that moment for me. And it's carried with me in many other projects that I have done since then. So I have got to work with other indigenous artists telling really beautiful stories. And I did a, um, a song about Mabel Battaglia. All of those kind of political academic songs all started with this first song that I did at, at the Center of Dialogue. Um, so then that brings me to the end of my speech. So I Googled how to end a retirement speech. And, uh, <laughs> the number one uh, recommendation is to end with a quote. So um, I was like, why not quote Mark himself? Um, and it's funny, if you look up Mark's quotes, like your quotes are very B-related, but you've been in dialogue for so long, so we need some like dialogue quotes. Uh, so this was a B quote, um, and this is from Mark. Um, it said, most significantly, we and Bs often change our behavior based on a conversation. So that one conversation that I had with Mark had changed my entire music career. Yeah, it's insane. <laughs> and also all the other people that I worked with on that song that graduated from that same court. So for that conversation, Mark, like for you, I am so grateful. Thanks. You really start to worry. But don't worry. Uh, funny that so many of you mentioned Winston Isaac, because the... Uh, Students one semester actually made a word called to Winstonize. And the um, meaning was cut out half the words and get straight to the point. <laughs> so with a word like that in my history, I don't think I could really go on forever. I have jotted down a few notes. Um, as you can imagine, it's quite an emotional day for me. And I hope to get through this. <laughs> I thought having some notes might, uh, might help. 
Uh, thanks so much to Deb and Amy and um, Hussein. Brought back so many great memories. It was just such a delight to hear the three of you. Um, I'm not going to tell stories about the three of you because the three of you actually told a lot of the stories that I often tell about you. <laughs> and uh, it was funny because I really didn't know who was going to come up and talk to me. And um, I have stories about each of you. Deb, I often tell the story about uh, Shell Oil and your grandfather. And you're saying you're, you're, uh, you told your story much more eloquent than I do. I tell it also a little bit near the community as well. And Amy, your trip to Douglas College that first day, that, uh, that's something that um, I also like to talk about because it's such a, just evidence of so much you know, resilience on your part. Um, at these retirement things, people often do a number of things, and I'm just gonna do three. I want to talk a little bit about what I'm going to do next, because people always ask you that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to not share my wisdom. <laughs> and, uh, I'm going to do a few, few appreciations. Um, I've been retired for 12 days now. And, uh, <laughs> I, I am loving it. I'm, uh, I'm just appreciating every moment, slowing down, relaxing. I don't have any great plans to take up a new hobby, to write a book, to travel the world. I'm really just looking forward to appreciating, to going slow, to um, enjoying family time, spending more time with Lori, seeing our grandkids. Um, I'll still do a bit of work. Uh, I've loved the work I've done. For me, work has never um, seemed like work. So retirement to me is, I know I don't want to accomplish a lot, but I love writing. I'll probably still do a bit of writing, although I can promise you now, you heard it today, I'm never going to write another book. Uh, I love mentoring writers. I mm. spent some time with the Vancouver Manuscript Intensive Group now and um, helping writers with their manuscripts. And I'll probably keep teaching a continuing studies course that I've done on um, writing nonfiction. And those of you who are still around the center, you know, I'm always happy to help you with your writing as well. Occasionally I'll do a workshop on writing or in dialogue, maybe facilitate something. But my one my one really tangible thing I want to do in retirement is to ramp up having coffee with people. Mm. <laughs> that is my biggest joy. And um, I hope um, with friends, with colleagues, with students, current students, past <coughs> students, I really hope to regularly connect with uh, many of you over the occasional cup. I can't think of any greater pleasure than sitting down and uh, talking with you and, and those who aren't here today as well. The um, second thing that retirees do is share the wisdom. After all, you know, we've, uh, we really need to be telling those of you who are still employed what to do. <laughs> <laughs> and generally, it's pretty much what we did. And we kind of forget that we didn't always get it right. So I'm mostly going to avoid that. But I, I did want to comment a bit on my own experience, because I have treasured dialogue as a mode of community engagement and a transformative tool for student learning. At the center and in the semester through dialogue, I think we created an internal culture, both in our classrooms and in the work culture at the center, that was unusually characterized by mutual support and caring for each other. Uh, like many of you, I grew into that welcoming space, and I lost the separation between personal and professional that way too often characterizes who we are at work. And I may be naive, but I do believe that through dialogue, we have and continue to provide a place uh, for those who don't always have the opportunity to hear their own voices and to find their own voices. And it's an opportunity for all of us to listen and deepen our commitment to each other. I know through dialogue, my world expanded far beyond the scientist I've been. I came to appreciate the many voices and ways of knowing, including indigenous voices, people of color, the full range of genders, everything about students. I learned much more than I taught from those who were marginalized for health reasons, poverty, differing abilities, many other reasons. So this is the one bit of advice I will pass on, maybe, maybe less advice and more of a hope. I hope you don't forget that dialogue is at its richest when it happens between those who are not in our own small bubbles. And it's at its most effective when understanding, compassion, replace judgment. Mm -hmm. 
the last thing I wanted to do was just end with uh, appreciation, and I could really go on for a long time with that. I am so tempted to acknowledge each of you individually, person by person, but first that would take a really long time. <laughs> And second, I am absolutely terrified of missing someone. <laughs> so I thought about how could I express my gratitude to all of you, individually and collectively. And I eventually recalled what I used to do when I was the director of the center on uh, Friday afternoons. I did two things. First, I would go down to that little kiosk that's across from Tim Hortons and Harbor Center, and I'd buy a bag of pretzels. <laughs> and I would put it out for everybody to eat. Uh, Brenda has reminded me that I was probably the only one who ate those pretzels. <laughs> <laughs> so, for those of you who may have been around then, it's the thought that counts. <laughs> There's a big bowl of pretzels there, and I've noticed that nobody has eaten them. <laughs> so I have, a, I have a feeling that we may be, sorry, we may be taking home the pretzels too. <laughs> but there's something else I would do. Um, I'd go around and I would thank everyone individually for their work that week. And while I can't thank you all individually, you know, collectively, I did what, see, here's where I have to <laughs> Here's where I'm glad I wrote things down. I'm so grateful to each of you for your dedication, your commitment, your hard work. I, I do believe it, that the world is better for what we've done at the Center for Dialogue, what we've done in the semester, what we do now, and what I hope will continue to do in the future. It's so funny you refer to that course that I imagined, because it's in here in my notes. <laughs> Making the world a better place. It's a three credit course that I think the university should, uh, should have as a requirement, so that we could apply the privilege of a university of education to helping others, whatever your vision of that might be. And every student would take this course, 20 students with a professor, and they'd have to design and try to implement something that in their mind would make the world a little bit better. I think that's what we do at the Center for Dialogue. That's what we do at the semester. Maybe it'll never be a university course, but I think we've at least made some, some inroads in uh, that concept that we are here to serve, not only to, uh, not only to learn. And it was so funny, Deb, that you told that do your duty story, because I was just telling that story the other day. And um, I think that's also something that I'm so grateful to all of you for doing your duty. We uh, live through difficult times today, we go on and on about the things wrong in the world, but even at our human best, I think we've always been faced with personal and societal challenges. Inequality, tribalism, racism, economic disparities, natural human-caused ecological disasters. Through the work that you all do here, and hopefully will continue to do, you give that voice to those who aren't always heard provide a platform for the really difficult conversations, a place to listen more than judge. And through dialogue, I think we develop ideas, maybe, just maybe, might move the dial a little bit towards that better world. Uh, during whatever tough days you may encounter in the future at work, I hope you do try to remember that this is not just a job, but you do answer to a higher calling in whatever way you can to make a positive difference. And I always so appreciated that about the work and teaching and learning culture that we have at the Center for Dialogue. And I have so appreciated that about SFU. I've been here for 42 years. And um, you know, there's been a few ups and downs here and there, as you always have in a job. But by and large, I have loved this university. And I'm so grateful. Water <laughs> and a chance to work uh, to work in a place that would um, let us do the things we did, and you can see from the three students that we so kindly shared your thoughts. Those are just three of the many who mm -hmm. um, I think really came through our programs with um, at least the desire and also the skills to make the world a little bit better. Um, I want to conclude, I guess, just by, first I want to acknowledge um, there's a few of my friends here today, civilians in the dialogue world. <laughs> uh, 
people so hurt. I told you I get emotional. <laughs> people important to me and our two daughters who are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we often credit friends, family, for their indirect role in our work lives. So it's certainly true to me that friends, family, their support, listening when I've unloaded those difficult days, uh, their wise counsel, their interests, they've all been instrumental in any professional successes that I've had. But I hope, I think, that I've been a better friend, better father, a better spouse, because of, uh, <coughs> because of the 20 years I've spent immersed in dialogue here at the center. And I know that I've been a better person at work. I've been a better person at work as the love that permeates my life off campus has opened my heart at work. That's really all this dialogue stuff is about in the end. It's about caring, caring for, supporting each other, and understanding that <clears throat> it's in a community that we reach the best of who we can be. So thank you for being my community. Mm -hmm.